S7 um, on expungement. And I would, would it be preferable to have the redraft on our screen sharing to go over and see where people have issues? <clears throat> I forgot Whatever. to say this is Senate Judiciary. We're taking up S7 on uh, expungements. Um, and it is uh, February 23rd, one day after George Washington's birthday. So why don't we go through um, the 20, it's a 23 page bill and I didn't print it out at this point. So go ahead, Bryn, if you could. Okay. So good morning committee for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council here to talk about draft 1.2 of S7, the expungement bill. Can everyone see it on my screen okay? Yes, see it on your thank screen, you. I mean. um, okay, so this bill, I just wanted to preface my remarks this morning by saying that I did send out a draft 1.1 of this amendment last week, I believe, or maybe it was Sunday. Um, and I, this draft 1.2 is substantively um, the same as draft 1.1. I did just make a couple of technical changes um, at the request of uh, Maraid and um, some other witnesses, I believe. So um, for all of the witnesses who wanna, who are concerned that this might be very different, it's not, it's um, substantively the same as what was sent out on Sunday. So I'm gonna um, just jump right in and start with the first change, which is um, I believe on page three. And this is um, that we've, I've removed the strike through of subdivision B for that cross-reference to um, gross, grossly negligent operation of a motor vehicle resulting in serious bodily injury or death. The committee will remember there was some discussion about, um, about that what was supposed to be a technical amendment may have had a broader impact. And so we, we fixed that. Um, so I'll move on to page four. This is a new section that was put in um, at the request of Maraid from Legal Aid. Um, and if you remember, this, this is the new language on the surcharge, um, makes a change to this statute in the fines, costs, and penalties chapter of Title 13. And the intent, intent of this language is to operationalize that change that you made in the miscellaneous judiciary bill last year um, that provided that courts can waive surcharges um, associated with petitions to seal or expunge. So this language really is just intended to operationalize that change that you made last year. Somebody leaving a long message on my phone. Um, I muted myself. Um, any comments on this change from anyone? Okay. Okay. So I'll keep going. Quite a bit of scrolling here. Apologies. So the next change is on page eight, and this is a change to the definition of subsequent offense. Um, and this is really clarifying that a subsequent event offense is the conviction of a crime, um, a later crime that's that is committed by the person who's, who's um, petitioning to have their records sealed or expunged. Um, and so that just tightens up that definition. So it does not apply to charges, subsequent charges. It only applies to subsequent convictions. Bryn. Comments? Yeah, Senator Benning. Oh, sorry, that, I think that was me, Dick. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Senator Baruth, how could I mistake <laughs> two of you? So does that mean that someone could be currently charged and in the process of being adjudicated, but not yet convicted and be allowed to seal or expunge? Depending on the circumstances, um, yes. So as you know, the, the expungement section has um, various timeframes that are associated with being able to petition for a seal, a sealing order or an expungement order. So if a person was charged and um, being adjudicated, it's possible that they may have that petition be able to move forward. Um, you may want to hear from other other people who are, like Judge Gerson may have a comment on that. Um, yeah, that, that sounds a little, this is where um, I'm a little confused. So just so I'm clear, I 
was convicted of um, automobile theft, grand larceny of an automobile. And then 10 years later, um, I asked to have it expunged, but I've got a conviction for the same offense pending. Does this say I can get my old one done? Um, so it, again, I think it, it's, as, as you know, the statute is so complicated with the um, time frames that it sets out that it would depend on how, how long it had been. So subsequent offense sort of starts the clock for waiting for um, eligibility for being able to seal or expunge. So depending on the time frame, it's possible that yes, you would be able to if you were just charged with another offense and hadn't yet been convicted, depending on how long it had been. All right. Any comments from anybody in the audience? Uh, James Pepper, state's attorneys. James Pepper from the state's attorneys and sheriffs. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that it's that is true. Uh, the the situation that you laid out, Senator, is would be true. There is always the ability. There is some discretion with the state's attorneys to not stipulate to the petition. Um, for instance, if there was a pending charge that looked pretty likely that it was going to lead to a conviction, that person would then be entitled to a hearing um, where the state's attorney could lay out his or her objections to the granting of the expungement. And ultimately, a judge would decide one way or the other whether granting that expungement for that 10-year-old conviction while there was a charge pending was in the interest of justice. So there are some checks and balances that would remain even with this language. Can somebody get their arrest expunged if they weren't found guilty? Uh, yes, that's uh, dealt with in a separate section of the expungement chapters. That's but what any, I thought. Right. Yeah, so, that's almost, that, that's a very quick expungement without a waiting, with only a 60 day waiting period. Yeah. <clears throat> um, especially in today's does the state do the state's attorney support this language or oppose it? This our support of this language, I think it is a helpful clarification about what subsequent offense means, um, because I think that the way that the statute currently uh, is written leaves some uh, level of interpretation that can lead to some of the disparities. But um, I think this highlights a subsequent part of the bill. Uh, about who can stipulate to early petitions, whether it should be both the state's attorney and the um, and the attorney general, or just the state's attorney, uh, or the, only the or just the office that prosecuted the offense, because that office will know about these kind of subsequent offenses better than perhaps uh, the office that's not prosecuting the or didn't prosecute the offense. So with, the short answer is yes. Uh, the state's attorneys are supportive of this provision. Okay. Senator Sears, this is Judge Grierson. Yep. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Um, the way that uh, Pepper just described the scenario, um, if a petition came into the court uh, and there was a charge pending um, and there was no agreement by the parties, the court would have to look at uh, whether or not it would um, expunge in, in the interest of justice with a charge pending. And I'm depending on the nature of the offense, the history, uh, the court would have that discretion. So the way he described it, it would be the way I would also interpret it. Do you have a, okay, thank you. Other questions, comments, before we move on? Okay, section three. Okay, I'll move down to page nine on section three. And in subdivision two, this is new language that, um, we were just talking about um, with respect to the office that prosecuted yep. the offense. So um, this language was suggested by um, the state's attorney's office, notwithstanding any other provision of law, only the office that prosecuted the offense that's the subject of a petition can stipulate to that petition prior to the date that the offense is eligible for sealing or expungement. Thank you. 
Um, any thoughts on this one from any of the committee or witnesses? Nope. Senator, if I might, David Chair with the Attorney General. Yeah, office. David. Yeah. I, I just wanted to remind the committee, we already had a back and forth on this, but I did want to remind the committee that this is a section that we object to uh, for the reasons I spoke about last time we discussed the bill with respect to um, allowing the Attorney General's office to serve as another uh, entity that can process these expungements, especially where there's high volume in some counties. And although we have not and, and would not um, attempt to overrule um, the state's attorneys, I think it, having that ability for there to be another entity looking at these possibilities does help promote um, statewide consistency and, and lower uh, disparate outcomes. So for those reasons, we, we do object to this. And Senator, uh, this is Marshall Paul from the Office of the Defender General. I'd like to chime in also. We object to this provision for basically the same reasons the Attorney General's office has mentioned. I mean, I think what we've seen around the state is at least at different times, given different, um, different state's attorneys, there has been, you know, all kinds of reasons why state's attorney's offices have been unable or um, in some cases unwilling to stipulate to expungements, but the attorney general's office does. And sometimes that's just a matter of resources. I mean, we've approached state's attorneys regarding uh, stipulated expungements and had the state's attorneys essentially say they don't have time to deal with that problem and then approach the attorney general's office and been able to um, negotiate a stipulated outcome that really wasn't you know, nobody objected to it. It's just that the state's attorney's office didn't want to deal with that process at that time. So I, I think that uh, to the extent that we don't have uh, the attorney general's office having the ability to stipulate to these expungements, it's really just going to increase geographic uh, disparities. There's going to be state's attorneys who approach these differently than other state's attorneys, and the AG's office can serve as sort of a backstop to provide sort of one unified, you know, um, sort of option of last resort and option for state's attorney's offices that are would otherwise be overwhelmed with uh, petitions. So we certainly don't support this amendment. And honestly, you know, frankly, I don't quite understand the objection or the, you know, the, the reason for including this amendment. Um, you know, I mean, I guess I gather that there's a concern among state's attorneys that the AG's office will stipulate to expungements that the state's attorneys wouldn't stipulate to. I don't know why that, that can't be worked out between the state's attorneys and the AG's. I mean, I can't imagine that the AG's office would really want to, you know, engage in that type of conflict with the state's attorneys, nor that judges, um, you know, if that kind of conflict was evident, would actually be finding it in the interest of justice to uh, approve a stipulated early expungement um, unless somebody was being totally unreasonable. To me, this just provides a really important backstop and a means to make these expungements a little more consistent around the state. Senator Sears? Yes, Senator White. So I understand the um, why the Attorney General might um, be able to be a backstop here and be included. But the way I read this is that leaving the AG out of this, the way I read this is that if a, an offense was prosecuted in um, Essex, this Chittenden state's attorney couldn't stipulate. So maybe we just add something in here that says other than the AG's office, it can only be um, only the office that prosecuted the offense, because I, I, I don't know that it makes sense to have other state's attorney's offices stipulating to the expungement petition. So I don't know if that helps or muddies it at all, but. To me, that kind of muddies it in a way. I mean, I mean you wouldn't I mean, want. It, here's the problem that I see here. We, We've had these days, like in Lamoille County, for example, if um, 
the prosecutor and the attorney general decide to hold a expungement day. Um, <clears throat> and somebody from Caledonia County arrives. Does this mean that, that they can't have their record expunged on that day? Could I, yeah. could I respond to that? Yeah. So um, it would be fact dependent. What this, what this amendment is saying is that this only applies when someone wants to waive the waiting period. Like the example you gave earlier about the grand theft grand larceny over $900. If someone showed up, uh, you know, there's a current waiting period pursuant to this bill, I think of seven years or 10 years. And if someone wants to show up after a year um, and the attorney general is willing to uh, stipulate to that petition, um, his office would have been the one that had to have prosecuted that case in order for him to stipulate. <clears throat> you know, if, if it was all this is saying is that in order to waive that waiting period, which I think we've, you know, there's certain, certainly um, evidence to show that the waiting period is an important aspect to expungement. Um, then it has to be the prosecutor's office that prosecuted. Well, the case. I, I, I do think that the language should be clearer that the only thing we're talking about here is the waiting period. It, it's, on line 18, that's what we were trying to get at, is that it may stipulate to the petition no. prior to the debate, prior to the date the offense is eligible for sealing or expense. In my, in my <clears throat> reading of it, I didn't, I didn't understand. That's all, that's I all. I think it should say a petition to shorten the waiting period or whatever the term is we use. That, that would be fine. The intent is not to remove the state's, the attorney general altogether. It's just for the, the petitions that are trying to waive the waiting period. Right. Committee, what do you want to do? Senator okay. Bennett. So, I can't remember whether there's a provision elsewhere in this that describes the respondent as being the state's attorney who prosecuted the case. And I can't scroll this because I'm not in control, but I understand the logic of making it clear that it would only be the state's attorney's office that prosecuted the offense or the attorney general for the rest of this provision. Yeah. Otherwise, your your potential for forum shopping is there. Yep. Okay, so if we could insert language that makes it clear to me, anyway, um, is the committee okay with this language? If it's just, if, as long as it's clear, it's just the petition to waive the waiting period. Yep, I am. I am as yep. well. Yep. Moving on to page 10. <clears throat> this has to do with the uh, restitution. Right, so this is new language um, that we added that is getting at the issue of, what, of a person's eligibility for expungement or sealing if they were serving a term of probation that was dependent upon their payment of restitution. So it provides that um, anyone who's serving a term of probation for a quali qualifying offense um, that's dependent on their payment of restitution becomes eligible for sealing or expungement once they've satisfied that restitution order, as long as the other eligibility criteria that are set forth in the statute are met. Uh, Bryn? Yes. I, uh, I may be confusing something, but I thought that was already the case. Um, does this change existing law or does it um, make I think, it? I think what changes it is that um, there are waiting periods that are imposed um, for when a person completes, uh, like satisfies the judgment. Yeah. So the, I think that the idea here is that once a person has paid their restitution, then they don't; those waiting periods don't have to apply. If a person 
completes their um, probation at the same time that they complete their restitution order. So I, I think see. what what changes it is it makes the person more quickly eligible um, to have their record expunged or sealed. Okay, got it. Bryn, what page is that? 10. Thank you. Page 10 lines eight through 11. Everybody okay with this? Oh, just a question, Senator, um, and to Bryn. So does this mean, I mean, presumably the person would have to be discharged from probation at the same time. Yes. And that's what, that's what really would start the clock running. In other words, if they've paid the restitution and that's the only reason they're on probation at that point, presumably they would be discharged from probation and that would start the clock running on whatever time frame this offense falls under. Yeah, but does that line up with the probation bill? Well, that's why I was asking, Senator. That, that that's 45. So... We you ask the question again? The, is it, does it line does up? Does this with line up with S45 where you can get off probation? I'd have to look at S45. Yeah, it's not there. In other words, Bryn, I don't think, unless you tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think you want this provision to mean that if they're on probation and there is a, these have to be an old case where it's a condition of probation, they pay restitution because we do not do that but presumably if they've then paid their restitution in order to be eligible for sealing or expungement, they would still have to have completed their sentence, i.e. it'd have to be discharged from probation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Judge, what about those old cases that somebody, for instance, has been uh, given a probation term of say five or 10 years? You know, I think if, I, I just my opinion, Senator Benning, is that if someone has completed restitution under one of those old uh, probation or restitution while on probation orders, they should be encouraged to come in and then petition for discharge from probation if that's the only thing that's keeping them on probation. I, I'm not going to disagree with you, but this would enable them to apply for um, relief under the, the expungement statute whether they're petitioning the court for discharge or not. That's why I was asking the question, because I don't think that's what would be intended. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. That's why I asked the question, because being eligible for sealing or expungement still requires them to otherwise qualify, which would mean they have to, be, they have, to have completed their sentence and whatever the waiting period is for sealing or expungement would have to kick in. I just don't want to have that term of probation and a person petitioning the court, especially in the days of COVID, to hold up a potential expungement. Well, they're going to be held up if, in my view, if they have, they've got to complete the sentence with restitution only being one portion of it. But, and if that's the only thing that's keeping them on probation, that's why I'm saying at that point, upon uh, completing the restitution judgment order, they should be petitioning the court to be discharged from probation, which would then make them eligible for whatever the time frame is for sealing and expungement. So let me ask it a different way, Judge. Is there any uh, harm in leaving this language just the way it is? And, and unless, someone, unless someone interprets it and I guess that someone would be a, a judge or a state's attorney, I guess, or an individual interprets it that completing restitution alone makes you eligible for sealing and expungement. And I, I just don't, I don't understand that's really what you want here. Well, I think we agree that this deals with only old cases because we don't do this anymore. But if a person who is pro se approaches the attorney general or the state's attorney and asks for um, an expungement, the state's attorney and or the attorney general are generally not going to petition at the same time for a discharge from probation. That would normally be the defendant themselves who do that. 
I agree. So, so I don't want to have a situation where a pro se individual um, is still on probation, can't get off probation, and can't get the restitution, I'm sorry, the expungement uh, given to them because they've got assistance of counsel, if you will, on the one hand for the expungement, but not on the other hand, unless they go through a more formal process to have that petition uh, for discharge granted. But if I understand your question, Senator, you would then be asking the court to consider sealing or expunging a case that is still a live case. In other words, it's still the person is still on probation for that case. And that, that just yeah, I see your point. Doesn't doesn't make sense. If I might, I think the language in here is a little confusing. I think it. I mean, I think that what we what was trying to be accomplished here was to deal with cases like Ms. Reddick, where right. someone was on was put on probation, um, and a term of their probation was paying restitution, and the only reason that they stayed on probation for like you know, 10 or 15 years rather than two or three years was because they had to do their restitution. And now that they've completed their restitution, it would seem, you know, incongruous uh, uh, to make them wait 10 more years to seek expungement um, just because they were one of the unlucky few who still left on probation with a restitution as a term of probation. Um, and so I think that what this language is trying to say, it doesn't quite say. Um, and I think maybe if we modified it to say something along the lines of, and I'm just doing this off the top of my head, so I don't know that this will come out quite right, but that if a person is serving a term of probation that contains a condition requiring the payment of restitution, that they shall be eligible for sealing or expungement um, after, and I'm just making this up, but it could be something like, um, you know, whatever the waiting period for that offense is after that period of time has passed since the uh, statutory minimum term of the sentence has passed, uh, as long as what, the restitution is fully paid off. Marshall, like I appreciate that thought, but I think what I'm going to do is, um, I'd like to get it right before we vote it out. So um, we have some time Friday morning and at the end, after we've gone through the bill, this may be the only change that we need to make, but I'd rather have you and state's attorneys and Bryn and, and the judge all on the same page on this so that we do get it right um, and make sure that we're dealing with that situation. So I, I wonder, maybe we can come back to this if we have more time this morning, or if we need to, we've got Friday morning to, to take care of this. And I don't disagree with the concept behind what it's trying yeah, to do. It's, it's right. just, we need to straighten out the language. Yep. Okay, so could we move on and then either come back to this this morning or, um, See if that's the only issue that's outstanding for the committee. We can deal with it Friday morning. <clears throat> You're going way through this thing. Yep. So the next change is on page 14 and 15. We've just added some subheadings um, intended to make the those specific subsections of the expungement statute a little bit clearer. Um, the next subsection change is on page 17. So this is, um, these are the requirements for sealing or expunging um, a qualifying felony property offense, um, mm -hmm. and then transporting regulated substances offenses. So um, currently under the current language, it's um, qualifying felony property offenses are barred from expungement um, after sealing the record um, if the person is charged with a subsequent offense. Um, and the language here was recommended. This was a part of the um, recommendations that came in from legal aid. Um, and what this does is it narrows that limitation, the subsequent offense limitation, so that a person who um, does, is convicted of a subsequent offense, 
is still later um, eligible for expungement of that sealed record unless they commit a listed crime within seven years prior to their petition or a non-listed crime within three years prior to their petition to expunge. So rather than cutting off people who are later convicted of a, of a subsequent offense, it just narrows um, the eligibility for expungement for these types of offenses. Any thoughts on this section from anyone, committee or audience? Well, um, the three years, I'm wondering, I, I heard Bryn say that came from legal aid. How does that accord with, that seems like the quickest interval I remember us considering in terms of these waiting periods. Is that so, Bryn? Um, I'll let, I will need to check on that. I can't remember any of the other um, language having something that quick because you could have somebody who three and a half years ago um, was convicted of an offense. That's that's pretty recent. Um, so I don't, that's that's my only question there. I would just um, so this is once a record has already been sealed. I just was I want to point out that we're not talking about the waiting period to have it um, have the record dealt with at all. This is for records that are already sealed um, to expunge those already sealed records, just to be clear. Yep. I, I think my question's the same. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if we're, because maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like these things will eventually all move to a, a common point. And are we establishing three years as a, as a, time frame it 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 just seems seven years ten years those those all seem like intervals where you could judge someone's um, changed behavior or a demonstration of that the fact that their other offense was a an outlier everybody okay oh. I'm not I, I wonder I've got to take care of something okay um, does anybody have comments on that piece of language? And I, no. I, I can't see you, so you just speak um, if you do. Um, good morning, this is Mairead O'Reilly from Vermont Legal Aid. I'm not sure if anyone from the committee wanted to speak, but um, if not, I'll, I'll yeah, go speak ahead. to this for a second. So the intent- Yeah, upfront about what happened. I, part of old age is you start bleeding sometimes. Oh, wow. I need to get rid of it. Um, so part of um, the intention so, behind this, oh, excuse me. Where are we on this one? Do you want to come uh, back to this or are uh, we? Marie no. is um, going to speak to it if that's okay. Okay, good. good. Yeah, so um, the intention behind this proposed amendment, and it is a bit different from what we had originally proposed, um, but the intention is that it's, these timeframes are supported by the literature on recidivism, which say that for minor crimes, you know, a three year period of time is really sufficient to show that a person has changed their behavior. For some of the more major crimes, um, seven years is, is the comfortable mark. Um, if, if a person has not recidivated within seven years, um, you know, there's not a real threat to public safety. Um, and, you know, that person is, um, just as likely as anyone else to commit a crime. Um, so I was just attempting to sort of track the, our policy with what the literature suggests. I think in my original proposal, um, there were a couple of additional crimes. It wasn't just the 53017. I think there were also some, I had listed um, the sections that laid out some of the felonies um, and the predicate offenses as well and was really just looking to get those, the misdemeanor crimes um, as the ones that, that uh, where the look back period would only be three years, um, if that makes is, sense. Is there anywhere else in this, um, in this set of statutes where we have three years? Not yet. And, and this has you know, been sort of a, a continued conversation that we've been having to, to attempt to sort of track that um, 
the research with how our, our laws are being drafted, but um, it was a proposal, so. Okay. Senator Davis yeah. here, if I, if I might comment just on the drafting uh, and what I think the implications are. Um, and, and Marie can certainly correct me where I'm wrong, I, but as I read this proposal, it's not actually shortening uh, the timeline. It's just changing the conditions for eligibility after the time has run, um, setting aside the, the waiver possibility for now. Um, so, you know, section one of this, of this part of it notes that you've got to wait eight years for the ceiling. And then, and then section two still requires an eight year waiting period before the expungement can happen. All that's changing is, is the conditions uh, which allow an expungement to happen. It's still got to wait the eight years, but now they're saying if you haven't committed these offenses in this period of time, you get to have that expungement. Um, if you did commit one of those offenses, then you got to wait, uh, or basically it disqualifies you. But the the, the change is not so much shortening the waiting period as, as just changing the conditions that you have to meet after the waiting period has run. Well, conditions for eligibility. Um, that, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, you've waited your eight years and if in the three years prior to that, um, you didn't have an offense that's outside of the listed offenses, you qualify, but you still had to wait the eight years. Um, well, uh, in, in a sense, I mean, it's semantic, right? If, if you committed a, a, a disqualifying crime, then you haven't waited the eight years, right? Because you'd, you'd still have to wait longer to get past the disqualifying crime. So that that's sense? right. That's, I, think, I think we're understanding each other. I think that's yeah. right. And, and, I, and I would just reiterate that the eight years still has to be waited. Um, in any case. I, yeah, I guess, uh, unless I'm reading it wrong, it just s sounds like um, If I were reporting this on the floor and somebody asked me a question, uh, which I don't plan to report this, by the way, um, I would be hard pressed to try to explain this piece. And I think, um, it's just not clear to me in reading it. Yeah. So if you're not if you're not convicted of a listed offense within seven years prior to petitioning for expungement, or you have not been convicted of an offense not listed within three years of petitioning for expungement. I it's it's a. Uh, it's kind of frustrating I'm not to be able confused. to scroll this because I keep wanting to scroll up to see <laughs> the section, you know, what are we talking about? Yeah. We're looking at a, at a sentence in isolation. Um, okay. A wait, stop there. A criminal history record sealed pursuant to the subsection eight years after the date on which the sealing order is issued. Okay, so, so there's a clock after sealing of eight years and then eight years goes by, you can get it unless you were convicted um, within seven years for a listed crime or three years for an unlisted crime. So if someone, uh, let's see, if someone in the, in the sixth year of the eight year clock, committed a crime that was unlisted, they would be ineligible for another year. So that, that would make the, the elapsed time nine years before they could get a ceiling. So the, the three years of position, petition or the seven years just adds years on to the eight year clock. That's the way I look at it. I, I agree with that, Senator. That's, that's how I read it. Okay. So so my question is, if we say three years for unlisted crimes, we're, we're um, rendering that addition of years shorter than in other areas, it seems to me. Um, we're, we're sort of... Um, yeah. 
we're, we're reducing the look back period to uh, an interval that's shorter in other areas, shorter than in other areas of our expungement and sealing. Um, so you could wind some up with somebody who um, waited their eight years, and committed a crime <clears throat> just over three years ago, and they would be eligible for expungement. Um, and that, that I, I understand what Mairead is saying, which is it's an attempt to nudge our ceiling and expungements towards shorter periods because the literature goes there. But it seems to me somewhat at odds with what we've been doing, which yeah, is this person has committed three crimes. And the last crime was only three years ago. So, I don't know if that was to me, but I can answer. I mean, I think the yeah, please. The, let's say it's two to keep it simple. And the more recent crime was two years ago. Um, you know, that one isn't eligible, most likely for, you know, obviously, so again, I'm going to set aside waivers here. That one isn't eligible. Uh, so, you know, that one's still on the books, but the one that the one for which the individual completed the sentence at least 16 years prior because remember, this is two eight-year waiting periods we're talking about. Um, that that one would then be eligible after they've finished out that three-year period. So it's a very <clears throat> old offense we're talking about here. And and again, the intention is just to ensure that people who have felony property crimes are not barred forever from expunging those offenses. So under under the bill as introduced, um, petitioners would be eligible to seal it. Um, and they would be barred from expunging if they ever had a subsequent offense after the offense that's been sealed. Um, our language was an attempt to rectify that to ensure that after some amount of time, and as David uh, stated, it's, it's quite a bit of time, but after some amount of time, that record can actually be you know, wholesale expunged. David, could you just explain the, the two eight-year periods? Now, now I'm again confused. Yeah, so again, Senator, the challenge here might be just not having a scrollable text, but the um, we're looking at subsection two, and yep. subsection one lays out the eight-year waiting period before you can seal the record. Yeah. Subsection two, it lays out the second eight-year waiting period before you can go further and expunge the record. Yeah. And again, Marie is right that what this amendment is doing is simply saying that uh, you could remain eligible for expungement even if you commit a subsequent offense, whereas the prior proposal basically said you lose the ability to expunge forever. And okay, uh, so if I could just say, Mr. Chair, I, I, I feel as though the whole push behind sealing and expungement is to help people who have obviously stopped committing crimes long periods of time have gone by. And in which case the state goes through a great deal of bureaucratic effort to help them by sealing and expunging um, to the extent where expungement used to mean literally pulling out tapes and erasing things. So, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of good faith effort. If somebody committed a crime, even an unlisted crime, just over three years ago, should the state be in the business of cleaning up their earlier record if they're, you know, in, in three years ago is not a long period of time. I, I just, I think at that point, they're actively showing criminogenic behavior. Why would the state go to the trouble of cleaning up their past record for them at that point? Um, I, can I weigh in? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I do think that if somebody has has committed a crime and 16 years goes by, in this case, it would be 13 years goes by and they haven't done anything. And then they they um, lift a pair of socks or um, steal some food at the grocery store or whatever that that is not. I mean, I think that they we should 
expunge their old old record. I, I just think that this is um, putting people, why would anybody try? Anyway, I, I think that the, we need to, I, I like this. I think that um, if somebody commits an unlisted crime, which could be pretty minor um, within that three year period, they've clearly been good for 13 years. And now they commit some um, minor, um, mis some misdemeanor and we're gonna slap them on the hands for their actions 16 years ago. We're gonna go back to that. So I, I like this actually. But this would, it may be would confusing, include, but I like it. This would include unlisted felonies. Yep. So you it said would. misdemeanor. Well, it could be a misdemeanor. But it could be a felony. It could be. I'm in the Phil camp. Uh, this is uh, James Pepper from the state's attorneys. Um, yep. You know, I was having a hard time really understanding this provision as well, but I think I have it now. Um, but uh, one just complication that I would throw in there too is, you know, you're talking about subsequent, offense, subsequent offenses that are listed offenses. Someone could be under sentence and seeking to expunge a prior felony and say what you will about habitual offender statutes, but that could have an implication on if you expunge a prior felony that was one of the you know pr three prior felonies that led to a habitual offender enhancement, then all of a sudden you know there would be a PCR a post conviction relief petition to to eliminate probably the sentence that that enhancement. So there there is another complication here that just we've started to see a little bit um, with the expungement expansions in the past, but it's just one complication that I think should be brought to the attention of the committee for this provision. So you're opposing this? I, I think, you know, with respect to the- I mean, I should say the state's attorneys are- The subsequent offenses that are listed offenses uh, where someone might still be under sentence, um, you know, attacking the underlying uh, trying to expunge the underlying convictions is somewhat problematic. And I think that that's why, you know, having them sealed uh, is a good path to go down. Um, but uh, I think the state's attorneys, and I, again, I, I don't think I really fully understood the implications of this section until we, you know, the committee just discussed it. But um, I think the state's attorneys would be opposed uh, for some several reasons. <laughs> May I just ask a question for clarity? Because I think some of that, yep. some of what Attorney Pepper just said confused me. Uh, so Pepper, are you saying that there's cases right now where someone has expunged a felony that was the basis for a uh, habitual offender enhancement and then filed a PCR to try to undo the habitual? I think that that's what this would lead the but door you, to. I'm just trying to clarify because you said it's happened to some degree. What, can you tell me what's happened to some degree? Because I was asking questions like this of our prisoner's rights office and I didn't hear anything like this. So it's kind of a surprise that I'm hearing it and I'm just trying to clarify what's actually happened. Is, have there been cases when people have filed PCRs to undo a habitual based on, because they've expunged one of the felonies that was the basis for the habitual? What I'm saying is I think this opens the door to that. I can find, uh, I can ask the state's attorneys if they've seen it in the past. No, no, no. My question was specifically just because you said that this has happened and that was concerning to me because I had tried to sort of look into. Well, sort of, and Marshall. If it happened, that's a different story. And I'm a lot, that makes me a lot more comfortable if this hasn't happened. I, I hear James saying that um, he, is worried that that may happen and he's willing to check and see whether it has actually happened. And I, yeah, no, I, no, take, no, I, think that's great. I take your I correction. That it had happened and that was totally yep. contrary to my information. And I wanted yep. to make sure before I said anything that I was using accurate information. Uh, it doesn't, to me, it had not sounded like it had ever happened, but then James was saying it had. I, we're gonna hold, we're gonna hold this one until Friday, I guess. And hopefully Senator Nick will be back. But if I might add that, um, Bryn, I would like to see it 
an alternative language that only allows the, a misdemeanor. I don't disagree with Senator White's comments about hopefully somebody stealing a, some food would not be prosecuted in the state uh, who was hungry. A small amount of food, not a trailer <laughs> truck. Um, but I would like it limited to a, a misdemeanor. Um, okay, and do, and do you have a time period that you'd like? No, the three years. Is, I, okay. For me, the, right now, I'm trying to figure out exactly what this does and give Pepper and Marshall a chance to look at further at it. Um, but I think I, at any rate, if we were going to do this, I wouldn't want to see felonies included in it. I would, I would prefer personally, I'm going to vote for it to say this is misdemeanors and people can make a minor mistake and that's a misdemeanor. The other thing that I probably should have added before is my reading of the bill as introduced um, is that any offense um, that was committed after the sealed offense, even if it was very close in time after the sealed offense, would uh, vitiate the opportunity to get that sealed offense ever expunged. So does that make sense? Um, that was also part of the concern that just because oh. of the, the timeline of when offenses were committed, if you're eligible for a sealed offense and then the very next year or you know, two years down the line, there's another offense on your record, that sealed offense is forever sealed. And I was attempting to sort of fix that as well um, because that just seems a little bit illogical and, and unfair. Um, I'm not sure if there's a way to fix that. I think we need a roadmap. <laughs> Why don't we keep moving on? I hesitate to say it, Senator, but I have to after listening to the discussion that when we talk about automatic sealing and expungement, this is a good example of why, uh, why it's not. And that's why I'm glad to see the language in the latter part of the bill that we can at least talk about a, a different process. I, I was just gonna, before Judge Grierson spoke up, I was gonna say, this reminds me of his um, periodic calls to consider getting rid of the two tracks and just having one track um, because I, I feel as though we're, we're creating a, a web of interwoven requirements and timelines that, you know, I'm just thinking about trying to count days of good time and how complicated that got. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, I would be really at a loss to try to take an individual fact pattern and figure out what the actual abilities for that person were in terms of sealing and expungement. I didn't like the two tracks when we first started talking about this. My only recollection of why sealing was requested was that there were um, individuals who might be migrant workers who needed to have some proof that they had an actual um, conviction out there. Mm -hmm. and I'd never understood the logic behind that, but th this has never made any sense to me. And I wouldn't want to be the one on the floor trying to explain this process at all. The, the ceiling, I think, was also because you have certain uh, predicate offenses. And without, um, without a process of ceiling, how do you get back to the predicate offense? If it's well, a I guess the, the other way to answer that would be that there's only one thing called an expungement, but is in effect sealing. In other words, the records are still still there. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget who who has testified it numerous did. times to, talking about access. The question yeah. always being that it's about who has access. Yep. Um, who is that, Jeanette? I, I think it was, um, well, I do know that it was the guy from the, um, from Council of State Governments. Oh, that's right. That's did right. talk about that. And that most places have only one process, but then they have, there is limited access. There's 
only certain people can have access and for only certain reasons. And that seems to me to make imminent sense to, to do it that way. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna take credit for that Senator Baruch, but that's, okay. that's what I've trying, yeah. been trying to say for some time. It's access meaning who, for how long and under what circumstances. That's mm -hmm. what we should be focusing on. Yeah. Yep. And that we heard that from a number of people, including Judge Gerson. I'm sorry. I. No, no, I, no, I, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along to line 10. Right. So are we moving, are we moving past the section? Cause I just wanted to point out that subdivision three has that, um, that order, sponge. right. It allows the, yeah. it allows that record to be expunged with the stipulation of um, the prosecuting attorney. And may, may I ask a question before we move on? Yep. Which on the expunge or on the. Well, um, well my question is since um, we have heard from many people and now uh, seemingly three committee members about having only one one track here and limiting the access as was suggested by Judge Gerson, should we e even start relooking at the way we do this at all and not passing an expungement bill, but just re redefining the whole system is my question. <laughs> Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have one more change to get through before we get to the study committee. Maybe talking about the study committee would, would help everybody think about that question that Senator White just posed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, the last change before we get to the to the directive to the sentencing commission is another request from legal aid. It includes um, some language that would require the court to make a reasonable effort to notify people um, who have had their records sealed that they may be eligible for a subsequent expungement after a required waiting period. And we mirror the language that you used in S45 about um, notice to victims about what a reasonable effort to notify means. Okay. okay. Any discussion about that or shall I move uh, on to the, okay. Mr. Chair. Yep. Could we hear about um, that from either the, uh, maybe Judge Grierson in ter terms of the, the that's, as I understand it, that's putting a requirement on them that they don't currently have. Is that correct, Judge Cruson? Uh, yes. Um, so the original language uh, that was proposed was making the reasonable effort to notify the person. And I, I suggested to Bryn that she incorporate that language from S45. I mean, the way I see this playing out, if, if the person comes in and their record is sealed, and, and maybe it's an oversimplification on my part, but I would think that would be the time to say, okay, <laughs> the order is granted sealing your um, uh, record and whatever notice we put in, I, I would think it would be simple to include it in the sealing order. So I don't see it as having a significant impact uh, on the court because we would be, we'd be issuing the order sealing and that's the, would seem to me to be the appropriate time to give them notice that there is a possibility of expungement in the future. But so would the, uh, would the sealing order go out by first class mail to the person's last name? Generally, generally speaking, uh, that's the way they go. Okay. Because we've that's had right. contact through, in other words, if, if the state's attorney or the attorney general's office was ever bringing this petition, they've obviously had contact with an individual. So uh, presumably somewhere in that process, they would provide us with a, with a current address. If they don't, then we're going to be looking at an address that is probably anywhere from eight to 10 years old. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking that if, we, if our files are updated at the time of sealing with an address, we issue the order, that would be the time to include in that order. Oh, by the way, you have the possibility of expungement, but our notice would be pretty limited. 
because you can see all the complications of someone being eligible for expungement. It's not going to be anything other than saying there's a possibility of you having this record expunged in the future. So I don't see it as having a significant impact if that was your question, Senator. It was, thank you. Moving right along. Okay, so I'm gonna to move to the last change, which is the um, last section of the bill, amending the directive to the Sentencing Commission. Yep. Um, so this, we've just added some language here to require the Sentencing Commission to do two things, to consider how to automate the process um, of sealing and expungement, and also to develop a comprehensive policy that provides an avenue for expungement for all offenses, except for big 12 offenses and it directs them to report back to the Justice Oversight Committee by October 15th of this year on their um, recommendations for how to make all criminal offenses eligible for sealing or expungement except for Big 12s and implementing a petitionless process um, to seal or expunge conviction records that both provides notice to the pro prosecuting attorney's office and also the opportunity for the prosecutor to oppose the sealing or expungement. Thank you. Has anybody got any problem with that part? No, but I would like to add my suggestion. Well, I thought we were going to talk about yours. Yeah, can, um, I thought we were going to talk about that more on Friday. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I thought I thought after Brent people have had a to chance to think about how do okay. we um, how do we I, I think the issue you raised re, raised is. We have some crimes that are sealed, some crimes that are expunged, some crimes that can get sealed and then later expunged. Um, it does create a confusion, confusing um, track. But I think more importantly, who has access to those records? Um, one was we did hear, as Senator Benning noted, from folks who um, may have had immigration issues that they needed that record to prove something. Um, so that would be a person who would have access um, with where there's a subsequent offense, somebody may need access. A DUI, for example, um, that was sealed. <clears throat> but I guess that could be part of the study that we asked the Sentencing Commission to look at. Um, it would be a huge change. And then the other two issues are the um, that have to do with um, section two, number six, the subsequent offense. Um, who can stipulate it? Um, and, you know, as a new incident, we said we'd come back to that. And then what we just uh, talked about, um, which is the uh, Page 17, lines one through seven. I'm going to include lines one through seven, even though not all of it is highlighted. So I, I realize that um, making a, such a huge shift is a, it, it's a major, major step, but it seems to me that every year we make the, the current system more complicated. And as you said, we need a roadmap. So we, we keep um, trying to uh, somehow get um, sealing and expungement uh, coordinated. And, and it seems to me that we are every year just making the whole system a little more complicated and that we might want to look at, should, is this the system we really want to keep um, and should we look at a different system? Pretty easy to put the two track question into this study committee. Yeah. I would hate mm -hmm. to try to do it ourselves with the short mm -hmm. time we have now and then all of a sudden find the house is rejecting <laughs> the bill altogether. Because we exactly. just can't grasp it. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's better to put those questions into the study. I, agree with I think so too. But then back Senator to Ruth. Yeah. yeah, back to Jeanette's earlier question, I think, which is should we if if we're if we're sort of acknowledging the logic 
behind examining the two track system and maybe getting off it, should we this session pass a bill that adds more layers of complexity that will have to be erased? Um, yes, so. I mean, no, we should not. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a tough question because we've done a lot of work on this bill, um, but but you know, at at some point we will have to bite the bullet if we're gonna if we're gonna re reverse course and go to one track, and so the the question would be, do we do that now or do we hold that question till later and act now as though we're not considering? Since we substantially passed this bill last year, I'm not of the mind to bag the bill until we get more information. So I think that um, this bill has some important provisions. We heard, you know, before the pandemic, before the governor's the pandemic had already started, I would say, but we before the governor's emergency order on March 13th that led to us going remotely, we held a hearing in Winooski and I think this bill addresses a lot of those concerns from many members of the public and I hate to lose the bill. If anything, um, you know, I think we've come a long way and um, <clears throat> so I would suggest we do the bill um, but uh, we take a hard look at the three issues on uh, that we add the the question that Senator White has asked the Sentencing Commission to look at um, the seal or expunge and, and what, and that we make decisions about the other two issues on Friday morning. Senator Sears, yes, there may be some parts to this bill that I uh, that I um, agree should be passed. Um, now that don't add to the complexity of the two two part system, but there are some that add more complexity to it, and maybe we should look at those and see if if it's wise to pass those adding those complexities and just keeping in the ones that address some of the underlying issues, whether it's sealing or expungement. Okay. When, when the committee's done, if, if I could comment um, on this section. Oh, when, when, yeah. Section which? Uh, on the section about the uh, the work of the sentencing commission, I, yes. I just re remind the committee of a, of a couple of things. Last spring when uh, the pandemic hit, you'll recall, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Act 95, uh, actually suspends uh, the whole process for uh, processing uh, expungement uh, request. Now, that's not to say they're still not being done to some extent. I think Sarah George uh, had testified to that effect, but there is a, a provision that uh, allows the court to suspend processing of those requests for 120 days after uh, the AO49 ends. And as of right now, of course, AO49 goes until the end of March. Whether or not it's extended, I, I don't know. But so there is this lag time um, that is possible where no matter if this bill passes in any form that there still is going to be a backlog of, of uh, these types of cases being processed. <laughs> it's number one. Um, and I think the committee wants to be aware of that. Number two, I noticed in the language talking about, um, and we've talked periodically in this committee as well as House Judiciary about automatic expungement. And in my view, automatic literally means there's no discretion involved. And you can see as you go along in this process that we've currently operating under there are any number of situations where some discretion has to be exercised and it should be exercised by law enforcement and the prosecutors and not the court. So when the term automate is in there, um, if that's realistic, it's got to, we've got to devise a system where there isn't any discretion. A timeline mm -hmm. comes and, and the file is sealed. And the only other thing I would add to that is that, you know, now would seem to be a good time to look at this system because we are now on the verge of uh, the court having one case management system. Uh, VCIC obviously has all of their records centralized. 
we have an opportunity to remove this and, and put it into an entity that their sole function is, is to process requests and deal with these records as, as one entity. Um, and I just think it's a good opportunity to, to, um, to look at the current system um, and see if we can find a way of improving it for, for everybody along the way, whether it's state's attorneys, VCIC, the judiciary, or, and the litigants whose records are affected by this. So I would hope we could um, continue along those lines. Well, we're going to take a break and come back at 1130. Take up um, robocalls. I think I got one while we were, um, I mean, uh, while we were meeting. So. Um, so, Peggy, if we come back at 1130, I don't know exactly what time. Right now, 1124, so it's a yep. five-minute break. Okay. Okay. So as soon as David Hall's ready, I'm ready. Ready, sir. Great. Do we we have a redraft of robocalls or are we just uh, we have the amendment that we started working on last time. Uh, didn't get uh, all the way through, I guess. Yep. Should I pull that up on the screen? Yes, please do. All right. Um, here we go. <clears throat> so hopefully you're seeing a strike all amendment to S11. Uh, this I is am. David Hall, Legislative yep. Council. Um, S11 is a bill relating to prohibiting robocalls. And um, last time we, I was taking you through this strike all, which still adds this new section of law in Title IX, uh, but now you know also includes this intent section, which would be codified. Uh, but the the real purpose of subsection A again is to try to basically say in plain English, you know, what it means to have a, a law that's coextensive with federal law. As I've tried to convey, the the difficulty with actually importing the federal law itself into ours is that it's it it comprises two separate acts plus the regulations, um, which the regulations themselves you know incorporate by reference other regulations, including pieces from HIPAA concerning you know what it means to be uh, a healthcare provider or a health message. Um, that is allowable for the purpose of robocall. I mean, the, the, the easy way to explain that is your prescription is ready, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, an, that's a robocall most people probably are not going to object to. But to get there, there's no easy, legal, easy way to, to do that without, you know, going deep down the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, 47 USC 227 or 47 CFR 64.1200D. Um, so to try to avoid that morass, which is changing constantly, I don't think I mentioned last time, some of the, some of the provisions in the regulations at the federal level that govern this stuff actually just took effect on February 12th. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, because it's you know, related to multiple agencies, the FTC and the FCC have regulatory authority. And then the technology obviously is constantly being updated. And then lastly, the most recent federal legislation, the TRACE Act, um, which we discussed last time around, which requires the largest telecom providers to adopt this shaken stirred system where they're doing sort of a front end verification of who is making the call and that it's a, it's a legal number. Um, they're trying to weed out these calls before they even get to you. But you know, all of this stuff is happening at a rapid pace through orders and rulemaking and, and new legislation as of, uh, you know, the course of this past year. So to try to capture all of that in words in the state statute would be very complicated and troublesome, I think. Uh, and therefore, you know, the approach that's easiest but also clearest, I think, was to try to say, 
our federal, our state law is coextensive with federal law. And then we looked at that FTC webpage together and said, here's what it boils down to at a general level, tons of nuance. And, you know, frankly, if you're in the business where you want to use robocalls for certain reasons, like you've got a regulatory compliance burden, no doubt about it. And you need to know what the federal law is and what the regs are. And it's hard. There are law firms whose job it is, is to create matrices and guidance documents for businesses who, who want to utilize this technology. But in a simple nutshell kind of way, here in our statute, there's a plain statement that your intent would be in A1 to create a state law prohibition on the use of automatic telephone dialing systems and on the placement of robocalls to Vermont consumers. It's coextensive with federal limitations created in the TCPA and the TCFAPA. I do say in A1, I use the word robocall as a matter of statement of intent, again, as of a plain English kind of conveyance of, of what you're hoping to accomplish. Understand that in federal law, there is no definition of robocall. And uh, we could try to make one up, but if we do, you know, I might- I don't want becomes to. What we make up might be interpreted to be different than federal law, which says, artificial or pre-recorded voice. That's how they sort of capture that component of it. And then the automatic telephone dialing system is the other component. In A2 here, you, this plain statement, you want to continue to permit certain robocalls to the extent they are allowed under federal law, including, so these are the examples. This doesn't change the substance of the state legislation, which is if it's legal under the federal law, it's legal in Vermont. If it's illegal under the federal law, it's illegal in Vermont, and we can pursue state law causes of action. But here, you know, we've looked at these before. Calls made for an emergency purpose with prior express written consent of the called party. David? From, yes, sir. Sorry to stop you there, but um, does express written consent include clicking a box? <clears throat> <clears throat> it could. So we did this with automatic renewals. Yep. Um, you remember in economic development, yep. um, you know, there are, there are ways to strongly nudge or even force consumers into clicking a box in order to move forward. And you can have language down deep that allows robocalls going forward or automatic renewals. I, I'm not suggesting that we change it if this is the federal law. I just wanted to be aware of whether that was allowed. I assumed it was because when my pharmacist, I get text and I signed up for it by clicking a box. Okay. I get text when my um, prescription's ready, for example. Yeah, I, I just pointing out it is a, a potential yeah. loophole for people to. Yeah. To, you know, it is. yeah. Okay, go ahead, David. Sure. Yeah, that is. So the, the, the federal standard in, in most cases is prior express written consent. Um, not all. And again, it depends on, uh, you know, what kind of line they're calling and whether it involves advertising or telemarketing. There's lots of rabbit holes you can dive down, but um, this would be something that's allowed. If a consumer has given you prior express written consent, there should be no reason, you know, to negate the consumer's preference, I suppose. Nope. Um, under C, calls conveying messages that are purely informational. Um, you know, this is, the, again, this is one place where the, the, the nuance of federal law is difficult. The, the statute says you can't do this unless the agency by regulation allows you to do this in certain ways. And then there's a regulation that comes after that and says- well, Would that include that my, my warranty is expiring and this is my last chance? <laughs> I mean, they could argue that's informational. Right. Um, well, the way that the federal regulation works, it, it can either be a call that is not commercial or that is commercial, but doesn't try to sell you anything so it depends on whether or not the, you know, they're trying to sell you or advertise or telemarket to you, or if it's by contrast is just a legitimate 
you know, conveyance of information. If your warranty no, they're is trying actually, to sell me a warranty, but but it's my last chance to do it. Right. So they're yeah. informing me. I mean, <laughs> arguably, but it's also uh, it's illegal to try to deceive uh, or commit fraud or abuse uh, okay. a consumer. And I, I, I mean, at least the warranty calls I get are for vehicles that I don't even own. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, actually, I'm getting mail on that too. <laughs> My 2012 Fusion's warranty has run out. Well, I feel bad for whoever owns it now. <laughs> Yeah, they're still trying to buy back my car that I sold in 2013. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, moving right along. All right. Um, calls concerning the collection of a debt, but not including calls that attempt to sell consumer services to reduce debt. This is not to be confused with uh, the specific carve out for collection of debt owed to the federal government, <laughs> which I think I mentioned before the Supreme Court actually struck down that part of the law because uh, they found it gave preference to that content-based speech over others. And so the federal government no longer gets its own carve out and priority um, under the statute, but uh, a non-commercial collection call is allowed as long as they're not trying to tag on help us, you know, we, we'll give you the, we'll sell you the service to help you eliminate your debt in 90 days, yeah. something like that. That's illegal. Still can do political calls. The calls from healthcare providers, uh, I mentioned, um, that's a very general statement. Again, there's nuance there about if you're on the list of the kind of healthcare provider and the nature of the call, and it's not selling you anything and it's HIPAA compliant, et cetera. <laughs> And then we talked about, gee, the messages from charities either directly. Yeah, I, want to, I want to clarify the... something I said the other day. I did not mean necessarily um, a huge percentage of charities are scams. And I did not mean to ex robocalls from charities, a huge percentage of scams. I did not mean to imply that charitable organizations are necessarily scams. There are a number of well-intentioned charities who do great work and don't have huge overhead. They're either, my experience is that those that use robocalls, those charities that use robocalls are frequently <clears throat> either trying to, uh, it's a scam, or secondly, they may be having huge charges for the administration of the fundraising efforts. So that rather than 10 or 15% of the cost of fundraising going to the fundraising, 90% is going to the administration of the fundraising and only about 10% is going to the actual charity. And I just want to clarify that when I said that last time we did. Well, I did not necessarily mean the charities or scams. So relative to the bills introduced, this does add the definition of automatic telephone dialing system. And again, this is from 47 USC 227, the, TC, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. And um, it's a defined term there. As I said, they do not define the term robocall, but they do define automatic telephone dialing system. So you'll see in C, line 14, the prohibition is to an, on uh, initiating a telephone call to a Vermont consumer using an automatic telephone dialing system or an artificial pre-recorded voice. <coughs> so those are the two things that are verboten uh, under the state law to the extent on, uh, you know, prohibited under federal law. And the rest, you, you have seen um, civil violation no. is a violation of the Consumer Protection Act. Um, and there is enforcement capacity here uh, in court, civil action, attorney's fees, penalties of 500 for first, 1,000 for subsequent, uh, criminal penalties of 90 days, $1,000 or both. And then each call is a separate violation under each of those provisions. And lastly, the AG's office should work together with others, 
state and federal to uh, try to identify these callers and enforce provisions to the extent it can. Do our bankers have any issues with any of this, Chris Delia? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your record. Chris Delia, president of the Vermont Bankers Association. I will be brief. Number one, I, I greatly appreciate you adding the intent section um, and understanding completely the complexity of trying to capture all of the federal laws or regulations and not wanting to embed those in a bill here in Vermont. But at least the intent section gives people some understanding of what's allowable, if you will. So that's greatly appreciated. Again, I understand why you don't include a definition of robocall, so uh, no issue there. But I do want to flag something for you that came up uh, that I learned this week, and it's related to embedding the definition of auto dialer. And I think this goes back to David's comments again of the moving landscape of what's happening at the federal level. So it's my understanding that there were just recently arguments in a Supreme Court case regarding Facebook and versus, I think it's Duguid, D-U-G-U-I-D, and it's specifically dealing with the auto dialer definition. And there are several appellate court cases that come up with two definitions. So the Supreme Court case is trying to resolve that. I flag it for you because not knowing what may happen with the Supreme Court case, your embedded definition may change or may have to change depending on what they come up with. So I just wanted to flag that for you. Um, it, again, is something new that I learned since your last hearing. And then the final thing is, I, I, I know David mentioned this in the previous hearing, um, because we've had two of our institutions whose numbers have been spoofed, they've still asked me just for a brief statutory reference to Vermont statute that would prohibit spoofing, uh, if that would be acceptable to the committee. Otherwise, we greatly appreciate it. We understand what you're trying to accomplish and support that. We just want to, again, as I stated in my first comments uh, in the first hearing, avoid any unintended consequences. So thank you. I'm good with spoofing being in the bill. Um, David, is that complex to add to the bill? Anti-spoofing? Just put in no spoofing, David. <laughs> um. <clears throat> So um, <clears throat> we have uh, a requirement that it, it, it's deceptively not simple. Um, I, I think I emailed to the committee um, last Wednesday that um, a few years ago, you all adopted a law, went through finance, working with the AG's office to require that uh, a person who is placing a telephone solicitation must provide accurate caller ID information. So they have to give an accurate telephone number and to the extent the recipient of the call or the, 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 the entity that is facilitating the call has the capability, they also have to provide an accurate number. I mean, excuse me, an accurate name for the caller. There was one caveat that um, if you were making the call on somebody else's behalf, you could supply the name and number of the person on whose behalf you were calling. So for instance, if VPR hired uh, you know, a fundraising campaigner to do a fundraising campaign, they could supply the name and number for VPR rather than you know, Peggy's solicitation services. Um, here's the problem. First, I, there, there's an issue about whether non-harmful spoofing is protected speech, and at least one circuit court has found that it is, and has struck down a ban on, uh, certain spoofing, and so you can't really, I'd be loath, I'd be loath to recommend to you to say, 
just ban spoofing um, because in some cases it's permissible. Um, in the, under the federal law, you can't spoof in order to deceive uh, or you know, commit fraud. Um, and that's the federal prohibition. And under the state law, there is a mandate that you provide accurate caller ID information. So if you were to spoof, you know, that's technically uh, right now a consumer protection violation. All that it's is already, today, it's already it's, illegal. It's already illegal at the federal and the state level. And I, I'm not sure how to <clears throat> thread it in here uh, at all, to be honest. All right. it, it, it appears in, you know, this is adding 9464E, I think. Um, I think the prohibition is in 90, uh, excuse me, 2464C, maybe. Um, so I, I can put some thought to try to how to reference it, but I'm not sure how to do that. To be honest. Okay, well, what, I think we're better off. We, you know. Okay. 2017, we amended 9 VSA 2464A to impose the affirmative requirement to provide accurate caller ID information. Yeah, we've had actually, you know, I've gotten robocalls from phone numbers like the one that the hospital uses. So you answer it because you think it's the hospital pre-registering you and it's somebody's spoofing it, I guess. So it's already illegal. Chris, any comment on that? Uh, yes, understanding that it's already illegal, we were just again, wanting to avoid the unintended consequences of somebody looking at this particular section. And because a bank's number was spoofed, um, that it was a problem for them. So that's why I was just, if it's a reference to say that what you've got in 2464A, uh, that prohibition applies here, but uh, I understand if David can't thread it. I just wanna make sure those entities that have their number spoofed are protected under this particular section. Are there any other areas that people are uncomfortable with in this bill? <clears throat> the amendment that David just brought. So, um, And, and again, I would just raise the issue of not knowing what the Supreme Court might do with your definition of auto dialer. Where do we want to go, committee? Uh, I don't have strong feelings one way or the other myself. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to mirror federal law. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm in support of the bill. Uh, but at the committee's discretion, whether it goes forward or in what form. Well, I, I think we should amend the bill as, as seen in the draft that David just provided. And I want to, uh, I realize that one could argue it's limited in scope and it won't have much effect, but the attorney general did say it would be a good thing to have in a tool bag. But I also think being that we live in a copycat world, if Vermont passes such a bill, other legislators around the country will begin to look at such a bill. And the more states that do this, the more um, I think Congress may listen and <clears throat> take some real action, um, particularly those that are from out of the country um, where they can, but at least in this country, they can do that. I, I just think some, you know, it's, I haven't met anyone who told me that they really enjoy the robocalls. Of those people. So I'll move, We usually I don't 
make a motion, but I'll move that we that we amend S11 with the draft that David just presented. Is there any further discussion? Senator Bruce. Oh, I was just second. Just second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none. Peggy, could you call the roll? Senator Benning. Yes. Senator Nicka. You're muted, Senator. Still muted. There you go. No. Now you're. Now Did you you're, say yes or no, Senator? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank Senator you. White. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Uh, I'll now move that we report the bill favorably as amended. Further discussion? Second. Seconded by Senator Nitka. Peggy, could you please call the roll? Senator Benning. Yes. Senator Nicka. Yes. Senator White. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Who would like to report this bill? I think it's your baby. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just call <laughs> on Senator Maybe Brock, my co-sponsor. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Just ask him. <clears throat> I'll, I'll I'll report it, Peggy. Okay. David, can you send me the clean version after it's gone through editing? Thank you. And David, would you send me a, a few comments about why what's here and what's not here? That would be helpful. Yes. Report. Take a poll. Of it. Senate and see if anybody's in favor of robocalls <laughs> likes them. All right. Uh, Peggy, uh, why don't we um, uh, let go of the adjourn the YouTube and uh,